this information here is what we did yesterday, pages 50 through beginning of 54. The periodic table looks a little different than the one, the, the uh, laminated copy on the wall there. Um, a little different than the one in front of your book, but the same basic information. This has some additional information. Remember yesterday, the biggest thing we were looking at was this jagged line, this stair-step line. And what's the significance of that line? Why is that line important to us? Metals and non-metals, right? Everything to the left of that, I've added these arrows here. Everything to the left of that line, we're going to consider a metal. Everything to the right of that line, we're going to consider a non-metal. A non we did say that there are a couple of exceptions. First one being hydrogen. That hydrogen is indicated on the non, or excuse me, on the metal side, but hydrogen is actually a non-metal. Okay, so if it were, if we were just simply looking at where it is, if this whole chart was based upon the stair-step line. Hydrogen would be depicted over here, but this chart is not based upon metal nonmetal It's based upon some other things as well that are more important and we'll learn those as we go But hydrogen is over on the left side, but it is a nonmetal and remember it's not a nonmetal because it's a gas The phase isn't the important thing It's a nonmetal because of the characteristics that it has and That this idea of phase we could have every element on the periodic table in each of the three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, if we had the right temperature and pressure combination. Everything that is exists as either solid, liquid, or gas at some pressure temperature combination. And remember, we said yesterday, the reason why we think of hydrogen as being a gas is because in the temperatures and pressures that we live at, it's a gas. But if we went to colder temperatures or higher pressures, it would be liquids and then solids. I think I shared last year that I remember as a uh, grade schooler, I read a science fiction novel, and it was about incredibly cold temperatures coming to the Earth after global cooling, because that's what we were afraid of when, when I was in your age. It wasn't global warming, it was global cooling. And so all the sci-fi then was about the Earth cooling down. <laughs> so maybe a lot's changed in 30 years, but anyway. So then, th the story was about this young boy who lived in a building and outside of the building was what appeared to be like snow, but it wasn't snow. It was solid elements that we would normally see as gases. So there would be oxygen and hydrogen and all these other gases were actually solidified and had precipitated out of the atmosphere and were resting like snow on top of everything. And so he lived in this building, and one of his daily chores was to go out and dig through to find the layers of oxygen so that he could bring them back into the building and melt them so he could breathe. And it just always stuck with me that, wait a minute, he's getting solid oxygen? Yeah, because outside, the temperature-pressure combination was such that oxygen would be solid, and then he would bring it into an environment where it would become a gas again so that he could breathe it. So if, if that helps you at all, think about that, that everything we have, even those things we think of as gases, could actually be liquids or solids if we're, we were given the right temperature and pressure combinations. So hydrogen, we don't say that it's a non-metal because it's a gas. No, it's a non-metal because of some other characteristics that it has. But this table is not based upon metal, non-metal primarily. It's based upon valence shell electrons and a lot of other things we'll get into as we go through the course. So we've got another exception, which we know as the metalloids. The metalloids are those things that have properties of both metals and nonmetals. But for this class, we're going to ignore the metalloids and say that every one of the metalloids is either a metal or a nonmetal. <coughs> That's not going to work. See what's happening. The remote is actually working, but the projector is frozen. So give me just a moment here. Okay. So which of the following elements is or are metals? Symbol S, where is it at? Well, it's right over here. 
I know it's not great from the because of the lighting. Let's see if what it would look like with the lights off. Is that better? For those of you that may be taking notes, <coughs> will that work for you? Do you have enough light to do that? Let's try this. So S, symbol for sulfur, arrow pointing to where it's located. Based on where it's located, is it a metal or a non-metal? Non-metal. Non okay. Calcium. Calcium is located, second column. It is a metal. Now, normally when you see calcium, a lot of times you see it as a powder, right? And what do we, what substance or what object do we normally think of, or do you normally think of when you hear about calcium? Milk, okay, milk is one thing. Milk's a liquid, right, but it has calcium in it. I tend to think of seashells. Seashells are primarily calcium. They need a source of calcium. You can take a seashell file, make a powder, you're making calcium. Or not making calcium, you're refining the calcium from the shell into a form that you might be able to use. AT, acetate, located way over there. Metal or non-metal? Non-metal. I forget the name of that. For some of these we hardly ever use. Thulium. It would be a metal based upon the jagged line. Metal or non-metal? Okay. So these three would be metals based upon where they sit relative to the stair step or jagged line. <coughs> Xeon, non-metal. That's a noble gas. Your column, eight elements over here, known as noble gases, and we'll learn quite a bit about those as well. But they are the most stable elements that you have. A lot of times in chemistry, we talk about things as if they're people. We personify things. We make kind of anthropomorphic associations. And I will say things such as, the noble gases don't want to change. Now what have I just done to the gas? I've given it personality, right? As if it doesn't want, as if it has feelings. It's sentient. It can think. It's a living being. I'm not, that's not what I mean at all. That's just a way of personalizing it so that you get the idea that those gases over there are happy the way they are and they don't want to bond with anybody. They want to be left alone. So you get the idea then that if I put those elements with other elements, what would happen in the reaction? Unless there's a whole lot of energy, nothing's going to happen because they're satisfied with the way they are. Okay. Hydrogen. We just talked about it. It is a non-metal, even though it rests or it sits on the left-hand side of the jagged line. It's the exception. We did this yesterday. Talked about um, if you wanted to make a wire for an electrical system, and you've only got the following to work with, what would you choose? Right. Because you have the three elements over here that are circled on the screen. Gold phosphorus, and bromine. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So of those three, the only one that rests on the metal side, remember one of the characteristics of a metal is that it conducts electricity. So that would be our choice, silver. And remember, between AG and AU, G, you would think that would be gold, but it's not. It's silver. AU is gold. Which of the following would you expect to be brittle? Now, we talked about the characteristics, again, of metals and nonmetals. Which has the characteristic of brittleness? Thank you. Metals and nonmetals, which have the characteristic of being brittle? Non-metals, as opposed to metals which are, it's malleable, right? Malleability. So a metal is malleable. A non-metal is brittle. So it says, which of the following would you expect to be brittle? What are we looking for? The non-metals. Which of these are non-metals? So we've got cobalt, cesium, and carbon. Which of those three is a non-metal? Carbon's a non-metal. So we would expect that to be brittle. 
So mentally, I want you to think, if I put that on an anvil and hit it with a hammer, what would I expect to happen? For carbon, correct. So for carbon, think of it as a piece of coal. If I put a piece of coal on the anvil and I hit it with a hammer, I'm not gonna produce a diamond, I'm gonna shatter it, right? Pieces are gonna fly everywhere. That would be the expected outcome for the non-metal. So carbon is the correct answer, answer there. <coughs> we, did <coughs> we did spend a little bit of time talking about compounds yesterday. Um, so I'm kind of picking up the last section we did yesterday and moving forward from there, that a compound is a substance that can be decomposed into elements by a chemical means. And I use the Duplos as an example of that. If you think of this, I don't need all of those blocks. You just grab a couple here. Basic form, just three different blocks. If I have a substance and I can take it and break it down into its pieces, or I take those pieces and put them together to form the, the substance, then it's a compound. Okay? If I take it apart into pieces, once I get to pieces that can no longer be broken down any further, what do I have? It's an element, right? It's no longer a compound. Compounds are made out of elements. Elements is the smallest deconstructed piece of a compound. Maybe that's one way to think of it. So the pieces are elements. The elements come together to form compounds. So all matter is either in the form of an element or a compound. So think of it this way. Everything is either an, a building block that cannot be broken without, you know, we gotta take a saw and cut down the little Duplo. But everything is either an individual Duplo, which is an element, or a combination of elements, a combination of Duplos to form a structure that we know as a compound, okay? Everything is either an element or a combination of elements known as a compound. The elements come in the form of atoms. Compounds come in the form of molecules. So when you hear the phrase, I have a molecule of something, you would expect that it has a chemical name that's not simply an element. I have an atom of carbon. I have a molecule of carbon dioxide. Find out later that means I have one carbon and two oxygens that have come together to form one molecule, the compound carbon dioxide. So two ways to view it. Elements combine to form compounds or compounds decompose to form elements. Yesterday we kind of closed with this. We started the, the conversation on the law of definite proportions. The proportion of any element in any compound is always the same, is the idea behind this. We talked about Proust. He discovered that when elements come together and combine, they form compounds, and they always combi combine in the same proportions. Now, Proust was doing this work from the perspective of mass. What he said is, hey, I've got so much of this in terms of mass, so many grams of this, and so many grams of this to form this. Or the other way, I've got so many grams of this, when I break it down into its component parts, when I pull it apart, I end up with this many grams of this and this many grams of this. Now, he used the law of conservation of mass in that thinking, right? Because if he started with 20 grams, he's got to end with 20 grams in some form. He's got to count for all of the mass. So, for example, water is made of hydrogen and oxygen. But you know the chemical formula for water, right? What is the chemical formula for water? H2O. You may have even said that before, H2O without thinking about it. What does that mean? It's dihydrooxide. Two hydrogens and one oxygen form one molecule of water. Two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen come together to form one molecule of water, H2O. Now I'm talking in terms of molecules. At Proust's time, what he was concerned with, this idea that, hey, every time I take eight grams of oxygen and one gram of, of hydrogen, I'm forming nine grams of water, okay? He wasn't, it's not so much in terms of the pieces, it's, it's in terms of the mass. And he says, you know what? I have eight grams and one gram to make nine grams, so if I have 80 grams of oxygen, I'm going to need 10 grams of hydrogen. Why? The relationship here was 8 to 1. For every 8 grams of oxygen, he needed 1 gram of hydrogen. So if he was making 
using 80 grams of oxygen, his recipe would require 10 grams of hydrogen. You see that they're the same relationship? It's eight to one. I need eight times as much oxygen as hydrogen by mass. By mass. Not by count, not by pieces, by mass. So eight grams requires one gram, 80 grams requires, t requires 10 grams. So what would 800 grams require? 800 grams of oxygen would have to mix with how many grams of hydrogen? 100 grams, right? It's the same proportion. I know we're going to lose some resolution, but we're losing a lot of students with the lights off, so sorry. Too many people are, chins are falling. <laughs> we're going to turn the lights back on before the snoring starts and people get embarrassed, right? So 8 to 1 for every... An eight to one, a ratio like that, it's eight oxygens to one hydrogen. You can kind of think of it as a statement of equality. For every eight oxygens, I require one hydrogen. For every eight grams of oxygen, I require one gram of hydrogen. So if you think of it that way and you say, well, I used, I actually used 80 grams of oxygen to make water. I need to match it with something, right? Well, for every eight grams of oxygen, I need one gram of hydrogen. So how many grams of hydrogen do I need? Well, oxygens, oxygens, left with hydrogens. 80 divided by eight, which equals 10 grams of hydrogen. See how that sets up? I need eight times as much hydrogen as oxygen. So in rather, if rather than 80, if I used 800, that would become 100. If I used 8,000, that would become 1,000. It's always an 8 to 1 relationship. Those are easy, but what if we said I used 35 grams, right? If I used up 35 grams of oxygen, how many grams of, that's oxygen, not O, 35 grams of oxygen. If I used up 35 grams of oxygen, how many grams of hydrogen would I need to make the perfect recipe, to make that perfect combination? I would need 35 eighths, and I could work out the decimal on that to what it would be. I need 35 eighths grams of hydrogen. So it would be what, four and three eighths grams of hydrogen, 4.375 of hydrogen so they're always working in proportion it's always working out that for every gram of hydrogen in the case of water I need eight grams of oxygen and he discovered that empirically in other words he went to the lab and he did it he just made made some stuff and said hey if I mix this much with this I get this if I mix this with this I get this but the, the breakthrough wasn't how much it required. The breakthrough was it was always in the same proportion. He could not go and make water with eight grams of hydrogen, or excuse me, eight grams of oxygen and a half a gram. He wouldn't end up with the same number of grams. You see, see what I'm saying? He would use up all of the oxygen, but he would have hydrogen left over. And that's where I said yesterday, a recipe in chemistry is not like a recipe in your kitchen where if you put an extra egg in the batter, for a brownie, you'll get more cakey brownies out, right? You'll still get brownies, they'll just taste different. And you ever get those brownies where you put it in your mouth and you go, it looks like a brownie, but man, this is not like the brownie you made yesterday. I use the same recipe, you might have thought you did, but you obviously did something different. You know, baking soda versus baking powder, you used three eggs versus two eggs, did you use the wrong amount of oil? I mean, you, all these different characteristics. In chemistry, if you think of the, the brownie analogy, if we were actually making brownies, there would only be one recipe for brownies. There wouldn't be a bazillion of them, okay? There'd be one recipe. And if you were making the brownies and you put an extra egg in there by accident, that extra egg would never mix in with the rest of the stuff. It would just sit on the top. Because it, you can't just simply add whatever you want together to create things. They mix together in definite proportions. Now, you might get something, if you had that extra egg in there, you might end up with something different, but you wouldn't think it's a brownie. It's something completely different. You know, you're, you're making brownies, you put an extra uh, egg in, and suddenly, poof, out pops a cake. You're like, whoa, that's not what I expected. Well, 
you recipe'd for a cake, you may not have realized it. So you're going to get out the correct product from whatever you put in, not just simply because you wish it. It's going to create what you've actually put together. So 80 grams of oxygen and 10 grams of hydrogen will produce 90 grams of water. Why? They always combine 8 to 1, and you've got to have the conservation of mass. The mass of all the, all the components that make it up have to equal the mass of whatever you get out. So in your book on figure 2, 3, it goes through this example. You've got 10 grams, 10.0 grams of sodium. Remember, Na is sodium. S is not sodium. S is sulfur. Na is used for sodium because it comes from the Latin name, the abbreviation Na. The abbreviations or the chemical symbols for all the elements always have a first, first letter is always capitalized. If there is a second letter, because not all of them have it, if there is a second letter, it's always lowercase. So 10 grams of sodium and 10 grams of chlorine combine to, to cr create 16 and a half grams of sodium chloride and 3 and a half grams of sodium. This is what's depicted right there on your figure. So I know from this a couple of things. And again, I haven't used this slide in a long time, so let me, let me look at it. By looking at this slide, what, what can you tell? Well, first of all, I can tell that too much sodium was put in the original recipe, right? There's too much sodium because I'm making sodium chloride. I'm making table salt. I put sodium in. I put chlorine in. I get sodium chloride, and then I get sodium. I get something in the end that is the same thing that I put in. I put in too much of it. Because I put too much sodium in, but I don't have any chlorine left over. You see that? What this is known as is that chlorine is the limiting reactant, and we'll get into that in more detail later too. But just get this idea that something's going to run out. And I may refer to this as what's known as the reaction engine. Think of an engine as running, right? The engine's running all the time. Well, as long as the engine has fuel to run, it's going to keep running. When it runs out of fuel, it's going to stop. And that what you put into it, these two elements that are the, the reactants, they're the fuel kind of to get the engine going for now. That's the analogy you think of. Both of those pieces are in there together, and they're making, this engine is turning, and it's making, in this case, sodium chloride, table salt. You've got sodium and chlorine, boom, it's going to start making it. Think of the Legos. It's going to take, you know, one of these Legos and one of those Legos to make the combination of the Legos. But at some point, you're going to run out. If this was one red and one blue Lego, if I run out of blue Legos, guess what happens? My reaction engine stops. I don't have the pieces I have that I need to make what I'm trying to make anymore. So it stops. When the reaction stops and we look into it and say, what do we have? Well, we're going to have a certain amount of the product we were trying to make and anything that wasn't used up. So again, if it's red and blue Legos that are separated, I look inside when it's all done, and I'll have red and blue Lego combinations and a pile of extra reds or blues, whatever it is, sitting there on the side waiting to be used up. And if we were just making one red and one blue, one red and one blue, one red and one blue, we got to the end and we had blues left over but no more reds, you know what? All I got to do is dump more reds in there. And suddenly the engine's going to kick back up again and start making them again. So when you look at the reaction, these are the, these are the reactants on this side of the arrow. These are the products on the right-hand side of the arrow. Look to see if there's anything that you put in that's still remaining at the end. Yes, I've got sodium, and I put in sodium. I had too much sodium. Or another way of thinking of it, I had too little chlorine because chlorine ran out. So chlorine, the actual amount we needed for the perfect recipe, there was too little chlorine. And chlorine is known as the limiting reactant. So we put in, initially, 20 grams of sodium and chlorine. 10 grams of sodium, 10 grams of chlorine. At the end, how much mass do we have? We've got 16 and a half grams of sodium chloride, 3 and a half grams of sodium. The combination of the two is 20 grams. So we start with 20 grams. We end with 20 grams. When you, when you add this 
look at this, this equation right here. My initial mass, that's what I started with, 20 grams. And I subtract out how much was used to make the product, right? This much was how much, oops, second. Okay. So we had initial mass in here. How much was, how much was created, 16 and a half. How much extra did we have? We had three and a half extra grams of sodium. If I wanted to create the perfect recipe then, knowing that I started with three and a half grams too much sodium, what would the perfect recipe be over here? I used up all the chlorine, right? So am I going to change anything on the chlorine? No, let's leave chlorine the same. But if I want just to make sodium chloride with nothing extra, what would I do to the amount of sodium I have? Oh, right, reduce it by how much extra I had. If I reduce it by how much extra, in this case, if I brought this down to 6.5 grams, right? 6.5 grams, I get that from 10 minus the excess, initial minus the excess, tells me how much was used. That much that I actually used in this reaction should be what I put in the next batch. If I just put in what's going to be used, then it should work out to be the perfect recipe. So 10 grams of sodium minus the extra I had, the three and a half grams of sodium, is going to give me six and a half grams of sodium, which is how much I should have mixed with 10 grams of chlorine to make 16 and a half grams of sodium chloride. So those numbers should match. 10 plus six and a half, equals 16 and a half. And that would be the perfect recipe. Six and a half grams of sodium plus 10 grams of chlorine produces 16 and a half grams of sodium chloride. If this is my perfect recipe, my perfect balanced recipe, and I put too much, we had too much sodium before, right? We didn't need that much sodium, so we backed it off and we ended up with six and a half grams of sodium and 10 grams of chlorine. If I go in and put too much chlorine in now, I'm going to still produce 16 and a half grams of sodium chloride, but this time the sodium is going to run out first and I'm going to have excess chlorine. You see that? If I put the right amount of sodium but too much chlorine, I'm going to have excess chlorine, but I'm still going to produce the same amount of sodium chloride. So in this first one, I have excess, too much, I have excess sodium. So what I do is take my original minus my excess to get my perfect. My original minus my excess to get my perfect. Now in this one, I have my original 15, I subtract my excess, which is 5, and what do I get? back to 10. I'm back to my perfect. See? So I'm adding sodium and chlorine. If I've got too much sodium, I'll have sodium left over. If I add too much chlorine, I'll have chlorine left over. How do I figure out how much I should have used? I subtract whatever is extra from whatever I started with to find out the right amount to start with. That is basically the argument that's given there on page 55 and 56 about determining by mass. Now, one thing you're going to pick up too is it's 10 grams and 10 grams, but by pieces, sodium chloride is made up with one sodium and one chlorine. One sodium and one chlorine. It's a one-to-one -one pieces, but in this case, the pieces have a greater mass or lesser mass. So sodium and chlorine don't have the same mass, but they still match up in a one-to-one -one relationship. You don't have two sodiums hooking up with one chlorine, that's not sodium chloride, it's something else. You don't have two chlorines matching up with one sodium, that's not sodium chloride. One to one is the way they match. And you'll find out later on that with a ionic bond like that, that's the only way they match. They're only going to match one to one. They're not going to match two to one or one to two. It's always going to be one to one. So example two two in the book. A chemist reacts 15 grams of calcium and 15 grams of oxygen 
And the reaction makes 21 grams of lime, and we have leftover oxygen. If the chemist wants to make 55 grams of lime with nothing extra left over, what is going to be the amount of each of calcium and oxygen that need to be mixed together? Well, first thing we're going to do is figure out up here, we've been told it makes lime. We're going to assume that lime is a combination of calcium and oxygen, which it is. So calcium and oxygen combine to make lime and some leftover oxygen. Without even knowing the formula for lime, how many grams of oxygen have to be left over? How many grams of oxygen are left there in the vat? Now, this is significant because when we start talking about these kind of reactions, 15 grams and 15 grams, that's, that's little. That's nothing, right? When you start taking these recipes and making them industrial, so now you're a chemical company and you're producing lime, let's say, if you were doing such a thing, producing lime to sell at market, and I'm the buyer for the company, if I go, well, we need to make a ton of lime, so I'm going to go out and buy a ton of calcium, and I'm going to buy a ton of oxygen to make a ton of lime, guess what? I know I've just bought a ton extra something. I probably bought a ton extra. I've got a bunch of extra of one and, un, and the other. I'm going to produce more than a ton of lime. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to produce, you know, between the lime and I'm going to have something left over. And I know at the end I'm still going to have two tons of stuff. But I'm going to have some lime and I'm going to have some extra chemicals that I can't use. So for me, that kind of a scenario might be tens of thousands of dollars of difference. 15 grams, 15 grams, not a big deal. 15 tons and 15 tons, it's a big deal. But it follows the same recipe. So when you get the principle of 5 grams, you can apply it to much larger scale. So 15 grams and 15 grams, don't even, don't even concern yourself with what it is. I've got 15 grams and 15 grams. How many grams do I start with? 30 grams. 30 grams of stuff. And I have to end with how much? 30 grams of stuff, right? If I start with 30 grams of stuff, I've got to end with 30 grams of stuff. I can't create stuff out of nothing. What is that stuff? Well, it's calcium and oxygen. And it's producing lime and have extra oxygen. How much extra oxygen must I have? Pardon? Nine grams. I have to have nine grams. Why? If I don't have nine grams, I've either lost or gained matter. And I can't create or lose stuff. Into, into nothing. It doesn't work. I've got to account for every scrap of stuff, every gram of matter. If I start with 30 grams altogether, I have to end with 30 grams altogether. I can account for 21 of those grams in the lime. And they tell me I've got something, I've got oxygen left over. How much? It has to be 9 grams in order for the law of conservation of mass to work. It has to be 9 grams. Now they could be wrong. It couldn't be nine grams of oxygen, and if I had another element over here in the reactions, it might be a few grams of something else. But they're saying, hey, we're only mixing calcium and oxygen. And when we're done, we don't have any calcium left over. All we've got is oxygen left over. And we've got 21 grams of lime. Can you please figure out how many grams of oxygen we have left over? Oh, it's easy. Start with 30, end with 21 plus something. The something has to be nine because of the law of mass conservation. Now, because we had nine grams of oxygen left over, what does that tell me about the perfect recipe? The perfect balanced equation. If I have nine grams too much left over, then to be a perfect recipe, I need to take that out of my original recipe. I started with 15. My initial mass was 15. And I had nine left over. So I actually used 6. If I had 15 and I end with 9, 6 has disappeared. Where has the 6 grams gone? It's in the lime. So I start with 15. I end with 9. 6 must have been used up here. So I change my recipe then to only use 6 grams of lime. I had too much, or excuse me, 6 grams of oxygen. I had too much oxygen before. I had nine grams left over. So I used nine grams less, which makes it six. And guess what? 15 and six 
is 21. So I'm still going to get the same amount of lime made in the end. I'm just not going to have that extra oxygen being wasted or sitting there not being reacted. Now, if I had oxygen left over and I looked over and said, hey, you know what? I've got some extra calcium in the back room. Let me dump some more calcium in. Guess what? It's going to start the reaction engine. It's going to start making calcium. It's going to start making lime. It's going to start making lime until something runs out. And when something runs out, I'm going to be left, I'm going to have leftover of the other. If the oxygen runs out, I'm going to have leftover calcium. If calcium runs out, I'm going to have leftover oxygen. And so the way to go back to get the perfect balanced reaction, and remember, remember, this is based on the mass. I need so many grams and so many grams to make so many grams. So the balanced equation here, 15 grams of calcium and 6 grams of oxygen make 21 grams of lime. 15 grams of calcium and 15 grams of oxygen still only makes 21 grams of lime, but I've got 9 grams of oxygen left over. Okay? So as a buyer, I don't need to buy all that extra oxygen. It's not going to be used in this reaction in the first place. It's going to be wasted, or it's going to be held for another reaction. Uh, but I'll have to buy more calcium to do it. Let's say, but rather than wanting to make 21 grams of lime, I want to make 55 grams of lime. In your discussion, you can see that over on the top of page 57. Top of page 57, it moves into this idea. Okay, I now know what my relationship is to make 21 grams of lime, but rather than making 21 grams of lime, I want to make 55 grams of lime. How much of each of these do I need? And the process is really pretty simple. If I know what it takes to make 21, but I want to make 25, what am I going to do? Well, think of it this way. If I want to make 36 cupcakes, but I only have a recipe that makes 12, I guess I'm stuck. I guess I can't do it, right? Or I'll make a triple batch, right? I'll make a triple batch. And so if I said, well, wait a minute, I know how to make 12 cupcakes, and I need to make 36 cupcakes. So if I need to make 36, and I know how to make 12, that means I need a three times batch, right? I just take the recipe for 12, and I do it three times. Now you know when you do triple batches and at a certain point where it becomes industrial and it doesn't work, but for our purposes here, I'm going to make a triple batch. Okay? Let's say that rather than 36 cupcakes, I wanted to make 30 cupcakes. Well, I want to make 30, and I know how to make 12, so what's that going to be? Rather than a triple batch, it's going to be a two and a half batch, right? Two and a half times as much. If I want to make 30 and I know how to make 12, if I make a double batch, it would be 24. If I make a triple batch, it would be 36. To make 30, I need a two and a half batch. So I take all my ingredients, multiply them by two and a half. You get creative on the egg, right? Try to figure out half a yolk and half a white and all that kind of stuff. But you can make a triple batch. You can make a quadruple batch. You can make a double batch. You can make a 1.7325 batch if you needed to. Well, over here, we have a recipe now that will make 21 grams of lime, but we don't want to make 21 grams of lime. We want to make 55 grams of lime. How are we going to do it? The same way. I know how to make a batch of 21, in this case 21 grams of lime, but I've been asked to make a batch of 55. Right? I want to make 55 grams, but I know how to make 21 grams. So what kind of a batch do I need? Well, 55 divided by 21 equals 2.6. So I'm going to make a 2.6 batch. So what I do, I take each of my ingredients. I originally had the balance was 15, 15 grams of calcium. I'm going to multiply it by 2.6. And I'm going to take my 6 grams of oxygen and multiply it by 2.6. And it's going to produce my 21 grams of lime times 2.6. It's going to multiply everything by the multiple of 2.6. Because I know how to make this much 
I've been asked to make this much, so I need to make a 2.6 times batch. Multiply everything in your balance equation. This is 15 calcium, 6 oxygen, and 21. Multi multiply every mass by 2.6, and you end up with 39 grams of calcium, combines with 16 grams of oxygen, oxygen to make 55 grams of lime. On your own, 2.5. Give it a shot. Start working in it. I'll join you in a moment. When 24 grams of carbon react with 8.08 .08 grams of hydrogen, it produces natural gas. How much carbon and hydrogen would you need to make 128.4 grams of natural gas? There is no leftovers. This is a perfect recipe already. So what is our first step? Let's figure out how much natural gas is going to be made from that recipe right there. How much natural gas are you going to end up with? Thirty two point zero eight. If I said that was a valiant effort, what would you say? I'm just going to see if they did it in the book. I forget what the, what the answer they, they give is. What do you think the book says the answer is? Not 32.08, but it's close. 0 0.1. Why? Because addition, this is the least precise. You can only go to the tenths place. So, yeah, it is... Mass of the reactants has to equal the mass of the products, and so 24.0 and 8.08 .08 is 32.1, because the least precise goes to the tenths place. We, we, when we did this, it would be 32.08, and that would round up to one in the tenths place. Okay, so this recipe makes 32.1 grams. We weren't asked to make 32.1 grams. If you said, if the, if it said, what is what do you need in order to make 32.1 grams of, of natural gas? Well, I need 24 grams and 8.08 .08 grams. I know that. That wasn't the question. The question was, how much do you need to make 128.4 grams? Think of it this way. I know how to make 12. How do I make 36? <laughs> right? I know, how to make, I know how to make something. How do I relate it to what I've been asked to make? You've been asked to make 128.4 grams. It's called the reaction multiple. How many batches? The reaction multiple. I need to make 128.4, but I know how to make 32.1. When I divide that, it comes out to be 4. It's a quadruple batch. It's a factor of 4. So I take my balanced reaction, and I multiply everything by 4. So 96 grams of carbon and 32.3 grams of hydrogen are going to combine to make 128.4 grams of natural gas.
So hopefully right here what you see is, hey, I knew how to make 32.1, but I was asked to make 128.4. So I'm trying to figure out, is that two batches, three batches, four batches, five batches, 2.1 batches, 2.135 batches? How many batches are we talking? Once we have that multiple, we just multiply everything from our balance equation to end up with the perfect reaction equation. Sixty grams of powder, something, not sure what it is, but sixty grams of powder produces thirty two point eight grams of chlorine and some cobalt. How much cobalt was made? This is a decomposition problem. We've got something all by itself that's breaking down to form two things. I've got sixty grams and I've got thirty two point eight grams. What, how much cobalt is there left over? Right? If I start with 60, and I end up with 32.8 plus something, the something must be 27.2. My mass of everything on the left has to equal the mass of everything on the right. The mass of everything on the left is 60. The mass of everything on the right is 32.8 plus some unknown amount of cobalt. So the unknown amount of cobalt must be the difference. 60 minus 32.8 is 27.2. So I know my balanced reaction equation then is 60 grams of this powder produces 32.8 grams of chlorine and 27.2 grams of cobalt. But I wasn't asked to make... Okay, so if we work the reaction the other way, actually we're asked to make two kilograms of the powder. So this breaks down into this, but these combine together to make that. You get the idea? This is my structure. I break it down into these pieces. Oh, by the way, if I have these pieces, I can put them together to make this powder. So the question says, how much of chlorine and cobalt will we need to make two kilograms of that powder? Well, we know that this is the balanced equation according to mass right here. I need to make two kilograms of this powder. So my reaction multiple is I'm going to take what I need to make, my two kilograms, and divide it by how much I know I can make. I can make 60 kilograms, which means I'm basically going to make a 33.3 .3 batch. I need 33 and a third batches of this stuff to make two kilograms. If I make 33 and a third batches of 60, I'll have two kilograms. Okay? I need to make two kilograms. I can make 60 grams, so I need 33.3 .3 of those batches. So I take my multiple 33.3 .3 and I multiply all of my reactants by that. So I have 32.8 times 33.3 .3 and 27.2, which is what we figured out we needed, times 33.3, .3, and that will give me two kilograms. Again, if it seems complicated, it's, it's really just a matter of saying, I figured out the perfect recipe, that'll make a certain amount. I've been asked to make a, a different amount. How many batches do I need to make? Multiply everything by the number of batches. I'll see you Monday.